contrary to the sound doctrine that conforms to the gospel concerning the glory of the blessed God which he entrusted to me. The great American poet Robert Frost once wrote about two roads which a traveler came upon. Now both roads went different directions and the only discernible difference between the two paths was that one seemed to be less traveled than the other. The road less traveled had ruts, but they were not as visible and deep as the other much more traveled road. Now in the poem, it turns out that which road the subject picked turned out in some way to make all the difference for them, presumably in their life or at least on that particular journey. The course of our lives can sometimes hinge on just one decision that we make. Sometimes the very course of history can change in regards to one decision, either made or not made. On the night of April 14, 1912, the watchman assigned to the crow's nest post atop the Titanic had a problem. The binoculars he needed to keep an eye out for large obstacles like icebergs were inside a locked locker and the key was missing. Right before the ship left port, you see, the cruise company made a last-minute decision to replace the ship's second officer, David Blair, with another one named Charles Lightroller. Now, in his haste to make that switch, Blair forgot to hand over the keys to the locker. And so in the dark of that night in April, Lightroller could not make out the iceberg until it was too late. If there's one quote from Martin Luther King Jr. that everyone seems to remember, it's this. I have a dream. That line came as a part of a powerful and inspiring speech on civil rights delivered by Dr. King on August 28, 1963 in front of the Lincoln Memorial. In the speech, King espoused his vision of a future that included racial harmony framed around the idea of a dream that he had had. However, in the original speech, Dr. King planned on making no mention of any dream. He had a speech that was written and prepared, but Mahalia Jackson, who was a gospel singer, was in the crowd on that day seated close to the front, and she yelled out in a strong voice that she had, tell him about the dream. And so King started to improvise. He began speaking from the heart, not his prepared notes, and the result was perhaps the greatest example of public speaking in American history. One decision made all the difference. You know, oftentimes that one decision doesn't seem all that important at the time we make it. We're unaware of the significance of the moment many times. It might be a book you decided to open or were made to read. Maybe it was that class you took in school and the lecture that made you want to take the career path that you're on right now. It might be a choice that you made as a party you attended as a young adult or a teenager. The first drink you took, or that first chance at taking a drug to see what it's like. It might be a date that you went on at the urging of a friend. You know, our lives are made up of countless decisions and choices we make every day. Which ones ending up, which ones end up shaping our lives in a significant way is really an interesting topic to contemplate. I made a decision once that in hindsight, turned out to be a major change point in my life. During my senior year or the summer before my senior year in high school, I uh, was attending a public school, large 
number of students, 15 to 1,700 students. It had great facilities. It had great resources. I learned much of my interest in music to that school that I, that high school that I was going to. But that summer, I went with my parents to a something called a camp meeting that was held out on the campus of a little school in the middle of Nebraska called Platte Valley Academy. And I had given no thought of changing schools. I hadn't thought about what I was going to do that much in, in any way, shape, or form that I recall. But something spoke to me that summer. And although I, I truly didn't come to know Christ until a couple of years after that, I made a decision that I would go to that small, a small little high school, a private high school in Lincoln, Nebraska called College View Academy. It was small. Our graduating class was 27 students. In a couple of weeks, I'm going back for my 50th alumni reunion. Small decision, I thought, but that set me on a course in my life that I had never contemplated. It changed my life. It was significant and seminal, so to speak, of taking me where I am today. My life changed forever because of that one decision. I guess I took the less traveled road that summer. Sometimes this less traveled road is the way that we think about something. It may be a direction in our thinking, in our beliefs, that leads us down a path while others, maybe the majority, travel a much well-traveled road, a much more frequently traveled road. And I want to talk about that this morning. But in order to do that, I want to take you back and try to put yourself into the first century A.D. Now, that's when the New Testament was written in our Bibles, okay? And I want to put us back into that world for a little bit so that we might understand our scripture text this morning and how in the world that relates to a road less traveled. In the ancient world of the first century, the world that Jesus lived in, the world that Paul lived in, the world that the disciples lived in, there were many, many roads to travel on when it came to deciding what you believe to be the truth. There was a lot of isms. Now, in my opinion, whenever you see an ism, you should raise an eyebrow because most isms aren't good. All right? <laughs> but there were isms in the first century. There was Judaism. There was Hellenism, Greek thought. And there was even subdivisions of that. There was a, a philosophy called Stoicism. You could believe in that. There was another one called Epicureanism. These, are, these were named after famous philosophers, Epicurus uh, and so forth. And there was Platonism, you know, Plato. You could choose. There was Roman paganism, of course. You could always fall back on that. And there were more even. But the truth happened to be on a less known, untraveled line. It was a road paved by Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who had appeared in the flesh, who had conquered sin through his life and death, and who had now risen to heaven where he reigned over all. That definitely was a road less traveled. Amen? This gospel message of that first century, when it was born and when it began to spread and when it began to be proclaimed, it seemed so preposterous and foreign to the thinking of that age that most simply disregarded it. The Jews thought it was a stumbling block. The Greeks thought it was foolishness for the most part. 
They just couldn't, couldn't get their hands around it. It's just this little tiny thing off in the corner that a few people believe in and uh, why they believe in it, they couldn't figure out. But still, there were others, there were some who were attracted with aspects of the Christian message. And many of these people apparently entered into the Christian church, but they could not accept the message carte blanche, so to speak, but instead twisted it just a little bit to suit what they had and what they believed in. This is what one historian, church historian said, the Mediterranean world of the first and second centuries was religiously complex. Do we live in a complex religious world today, by the way? <laughs> I would think so. It was no different 2,000 years ago. Religious ideas and practices from every quarter, Jewish as well as pagan, as well as the Christian even, were all freely circulating and seeking amalgamation into the vigorous and commanding new religious movement known as Christianity. Like a beautiful and popular young woman, the church had many suitors, each one attracted to some aspect of her, but anxious to add to her life and shape something of themselves. They were anxious, you see, to see her dressed in gowns of their own making. And this resulted in a phenomenon called syncretism back then. Syncretism is just a word that says two different things combine together and blend together, changing both. Okay? That's really all it means. And you have to ask the question then, did something, was something threatening to combine with Christianity in the early infant days of its existence? Was something threatening to, to blend with it in a sense that would change both the Christian message and whatever it was blending with? The answer to that is yes. Definitely the church faced those kind of temptations, those kinds of challenges. The church must always be aware that those who accept Christianity don't always accept all of it. Instead, they bring with them some idea or position that they can't let go of and they try to mix it with that part of Christianity which they do accept and pretty soon you have a different form of faith. I've talked about this before, but one of the, if not the most, significant challenge to the early Christian faith came in the form of a group known as Gnosticism. There you have that ism again. Gnosticism. Its believers were called Gnostics. And it simply comes from a Greek word, gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S, which means knowledge, okay? Knowledge. So these Gnostics, they believed in the primacy of knowledge, and not only knowledge, but a secret kind of knowledge that only the few, the initiated, could understand. It wasn't for the masses. It wasn't for the, it was above them. And so they were attracted for some reason to the Christian faith. And much of what we find in the New Testament when Paul and other New Testament writers are speaking out against false teachers. Many times, what we find as we look carefully at that, it was probably Gnostics in the church. Now, you don't really probably have to remember that name, that word, but it's, the reality is they were there. Um, some believe that the According to ancient tradition, Simon Magus was the founder of Gnosticism. You remember, he's the, he's the one in Acts chapter 8 who saw the miracles that Paul was performing, and he wanted some of that for himself, that secret power, that secret knowledge, and he wanted, to, he wanted that power of magic. And, but it's just tradition. He, there's no evidence that he was the founder of this. It really was a, was, it started among the Greeks and uh, 
spilled over into Jewish thinking later on. But a church historian writes this, and this is important to remember. The Gnostics would take any doctrine that they found valuable without any regard for its origin or for the context from which it was taken. When they came to know early Christianity and saw its great appeal, they attempted to take those aspects of Christianity which seemed most valuable to them and adopt it to their own systems. Now, this procedure posed an urgent challenge for those Christians who did not accept it, for it became necessary to show that Gnosticism misrepresented Christian doctrine and to show reasons why one should not turn Jesus Christ into a mere element within a Gnostic system. And that brings us to our book of the Bible today that we're looking at. Our text was taken from it. The first letter to Timothy. If you have your Bibles, you might want to open it to that now. Or if you have your phones, you might want to find that portion on your uh, Bible app that you've got. The first letter to Timothy apparently was written during a period where there was apparently a lull in the persecution of the church. No mention is made really of persecution here. You know, oftentimes when the church is under is not under persecution from outside, where does its greatest danger come from? It can come from the inside, can't it? In the form of false teachers, false teaching. Paul's first letter to Timothy was written during a time when the church's greatest test was to remain true to the faith that it was originally given. Now, if this book is concerned with anything, it is with correct doctrine or correct belief. All right? The Greek word for doctrine or teaching occurs 15 times in the letter of 1st and 2nd Timothy and also the letter to Titus. 15 times in those two, three small little books, while it occurs only six times throughout the entire rest of the New Testament. So that's the emphasis here, obviously. Correct belief, correct teaching. So I want you to turn there again to chapter 1, and several things should become apparent to us here as we begin. I want to start with verse 3. Paul says here, As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus, he's speaking to Timothy, so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer or to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. Such things promote controversial speculations rather than advancing God's work, which is by faith. The goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Now, some have departed from these and have turned to meaningless talk. They want to be teachers of the law, but they do not know what they're talking about or what they so confidently affirm. That's the problem. That's the problem that Paul's wanting Timothy to address. Apparently, according to verses 5 and 6, these teachers have turned away from important truths. The goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. But some have departed from these. Secondly, we find out that these individuals, they want to be and want to be known as teachers of the law. Apparently, they give the law a very central place in their religion. It's interesting that the Gnostics, by the way, were very interested in the Old Testament. It's found out by some of their writings. So, they've turned away from important truths. They want to be teachers of the law. But what they teach concerning the law is meaningless and without comprehension. It doesn't make sense. And we also know that the Gnostics were fascinated by genealogies and myths. Those are spoken specifically. 
The very name derives from a belief in a special secretive knowledge that only they knew. Now, that's the setting. What am I really talking about here? They want to be teachers of the law. When it comes to the law, the law of God, there is no end to a number of dissensions, disagreements, different opinions throughout the church's history about the role of the law, its place and its function in the past and in the present have time and time and time again given rise to a spirit of debate. By even a casual reading of the New Testament, it is clear that the Christian's relationship to the law was a hot topic. It's focused on in the book of Acts, the letter to the Romans, the letter to the Galatians, and by the way, our midweek Bible study that takes place every Wednesday at 6.30, we're studying the book of Galatians right now. And if you ever want to, if you want to really get a handle on what's all this discussion and debate about the law, what's it all about, and what, how is a Christian supposed to relate to the law, to God's law? Come to that study because we're looking deeply. Tim is leading us in that study. We're looking deeply at what the law's role is in the Christian's life. And you got to have that right. <laughs> we have to have that right, folks. A belief in that will take you one of two roads. How you look at it. I'll come a little bit more to that. As Seventh-day Adventists, we believe, do we not, in the binding nature of God's law, the perpetuity of it. We don't subscribe to the idea that the law was done away with, thrown on the Old Testament trash pile. We don't believe that. Our very name, Seventh-day Adventist, points to the idea of how we look at God's law, doesn't it? Because we believe in the ongoing, enduring nature of the Seventh-day Sabbath, which we find in the Fourth Commandment, do we not? We believe that that is the blessing and the gift that God still wants for His people. But... Paul tells us in 1 Timothy, as we look at verse 8, that the law is good, but only if you use it properly. Does that imply that you can use the law and understand the law improperly? It kind of suggests that to me, doesn't it? If it is used improperly, the law can be a very destructive thing. Listen, we as Seventh-day Adventists, we don't believe in the law any more strongly than the Jews of Jesus' day believed in the law, do we? Maybe not as much. And yet, curiously, it was the Jews who put to death their creator on Friday afternoon and then begged to have his body taken down so they could go home and keep the Sabbath. Something not right there. Something's not right. The law is good if you use it properly. The Greek word for law is namas. And in 1 Timothy, that word that's translated as properly, if it's used properly, is a derivative of that. It's nominos. That's the Greek word, which means lawfully, rightly, 
according to its intended use. So the law is good if we use it according to its intended use, if we use it properly, if we use it rightly. But what is its rightful use, you ask? Verses 8 and 9 uses the word law two times. In verse 8, it has what's called the definite article, meaning the law, okay? In verse 9, however, the article, although your translation may not show it that way, the article is actually missing. When the article is missing uh, in, in Greek, it, it, you would have to translate it as law in general or a law, but not the law. So, yes, well, is, there, is that significant? Perhaps. Verses 9 and 11 goes on to tell us that the divine law of God is certainly in central focus as we read the description of all those lawbreakers. But in verse 9, the words in the present tense, he says that we also know that law is not laid down for the righteous, but instead for those who rebel. We might have expected the past tense at that point, pointing back to Sinai, if the law of God was exclusively in mind. But what Paul may be saying here is that law in general, as well as the law of God, is what he has in his mind here. And now I just want to bring out a couple of points that this, this brings out. The first thing that we find out in verse 8 about how, to, how it's to be understood properly, remember, that's what we're interested in. We also know, verse 9, that the law is made not for the righteous, but for lawmakers, lawbreakers and rebels. So that first point that kind of jumps out from this text is Paul's saying laws are for bad people, not good people. Have you ever thought of it that way? Laws are for bad people, not good people. Laws are used to restrain and keep in check the lawbreaker. You know, all law has a built-in penalty to it, doesn't it? You do this, this is the consequence. <laughs> you break this, this is the consequence. You pay a fine, you have to go to jail, you, whatever it might be. If you were to go to a prison and ask the inmates, why are you here and what have you done? If they are honest, most of them, they would have to say, I broke the law. In our society is constantly thinking of ways to apply or legislate a law that will deter crime. I work in the insurance industry. Do you know how many laws there are and regulations to the insurance industry? Their name is Legion. <laughs> it's incredible. They put you in a box that's so small you can't even turn around. But we all know that society, as we know it, could not function without law. Would you like to see it try? Law and order, it seems, go hand in hand. You know, society is full of people, sadly, who are depraved, who will not or cannot be trusted to do the right thing, or the safe thing, or the honest thing. And so a law is enacted. If everyone could be trusted to drive sane, sanely and safely, you might say there wouldn't be a need for a speed limit. People would somehow realize that at a certain speed, you tend to lose control, and they would just not drive that fast. But no, we're not like that way. I'm not like that way. I got I to see that sign. I have a navigator on my, my car, and it tells me a map, and it tells me what the speed limit is. It's posted right there all the time. And I look at it. <laughs> <laughs> it 
sometimes. Well, you know, laws are always made so that you could drive five miles above whatever the sign is, right? Some, somewhere there's a law that says that, isn't there? I was certain that there was. So laws are there to keep lawbreakers in check. It was the claim of the Greek philosopher Aristotle that philosophy, he said, enables a man to do, listen to this, without external control that which others do because of fear of laws. Now, that was an interesting insight to have 2,000 plus years ago. He says that philosophy is what he used it, but it enables a man to do without external control that which others do because of fear of laws. And another Greek philosopher said it a little more simply. He who does no wrong needs no law. He who does no wrong needs no law. Another idea that comes out of this passage then leads us to the next point that somehow the law is there to convince the sinner of his sin. Notice what it says. The law is made not for the righteous, but for lawbreakers and rebels. And it goes on and describes all manner of uh, behaviors and so forth. The law is what tells them, you can't do this. This is wrong. And they seem to need to have that law <laughs> in front of them almost at all times. Or they'll forget or won't pay any attention to it. Which leads us to the next point. Laws are for bad people, not good people. But secondly, laws are for the immature, not the mature. Children need rules to teach them, don't they? How many have children? How many have ever been a child? <laughs> well, then you all can relate to this. Rules like make your bed, brush your teeth, take out the trash, pick up your clothes. When my kids were young, we would reward them for keeping the rules by giving them a gold star or something like it. Obedience earned a gold star. Disobedient meant no star. It's funny what a four-year-old will do for a gold star. As we get older, things don't really change that much, though. The stars just get a little more expensive. But children need rules, and they need a lot of them, don't they? Will a four-year-old instinctively know in their mind, I really should brush my teeth. I think that's important. I can see the value of that. No. They need the gold star. They need the gold star. Well, if, if I brush my teeth, I get my gold star. That's, I guess that's a good thing, they say. The purpose of moral training is to build up, however, within an individual as they grow, the inner motives and the restraints that will make legal restraints unnecessary. So, as we grow up, we should outgrow our need for rules and laws. Amen? Mm, that, wasn't very, that wasn't very convincing. All right. Let's go to Galatians chapter 4, shall we? Galatians chapter 4. Paul here is talking and actually begins in chapter 3. Beginning with verse 23. 
He says, before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So the law was our guardian until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. Now that this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. And get to verse, verse 1 of chapter 4. What I'm saying is that as long as an heir is under age, he's no different from a slave. Brush your teeth, pick up your clothes, make your bed. He's no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. The heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also, when we were under age, we were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. But when the, time, when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father, Daddy. So you're no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. Speaking of this passage, Gary Friesen, in a book regarding the will of God, writes this. As children grow, they, have get, they are given increased responsibility with increased responsibility comes greater freedom and less restrictive rules. In the progress of his revelation, God moved from a highly structured system of regulations governing a wide range of specific behavior to a system where behavior is to be determined by principles and governed by personal relationships. That was progress from laws to Christ from the bondage of close restrictive supervision appropriate to immature and willful children to the freedom of responsible adulthood. And that takes us to our third and final point. You might find this controversial. I hope not. The Christian, because of his love for Christ will not need laws to keep him in check. I'll read it again. The Christian, because of his love for Christ, will not need laws to keep him in check. Maybe we're now ready to understand that statement from the, the book, The Mount of Blessings, page 109. Quote, in heaven... Service is not rendered in the spirit of legality. When Satan rebelled against the law of Jehovah, the thought that there was a law came to the angels almost as an awakening to something unthought of. In their ministry, the angels are not as servants, but as sons. There's perfect unity between them and their creator. Obedience is to them no drudgery. Love for God makes their service a joy. Law? There's a law? <laughs> There's a law? We just follow you, Father. <laughs> we just want to please you. Paul is not saying that the law is useless. Forget about it. It is still the standard of righteousness. We know that in our hearts. <laughs> it's just as wrong to... Steal now as it was when the law was written 3,000-some years ago. The law is not useless. But for the Christian, we don't derive our fire from gazing at two tables of stone, as glorious as they may be, but by seeing Jesus Christ as the law embodied in human flesh and uniting ourselves to him in relationship of faith and dependence. To put it simply then, listen to this. For the Christian, sin should be the breaking of a relationship. It is the wounding of a heart. 
It is the disappointing of someone you love rather than the breaking of a law or a violating of a rule or a code. There is a road less traveled, people. A lot of people don't get on this road. They don't see it, and I'll tell you why. It could be the same sin. But for one, it is just the breaking of a law. To the other, it's the wounding of a heart. And that makes the difference. Charles Erdman said, ministers need to be reminded that the gospel is not good advice, but good news. It is not a code of laws, nor is it merely a system of ethics, but the proclamation of the redeeming work of God, our Savior. And so we can paraphrase the ancient Aristotle's assertion and say that the gospel enables a man to do without external control that which others do because of fear of laws. Jesus is the ultimate law keeper. Amen? We look to his life to see what it means to obey the law. Remember, the closest definition we have of a Christian in the scriptures is that they are a follower of Jesus Christ. They're not a law keeper. You know, they're a follower of Jesus Christ. Gustav Kubizek was a contemporary with Adolf Hitler. And he tells of an experience that Adolf Hitler had with him when they were both about 16 years old. It was nearly midnight in his recollection as young Hitler and Kubizek stepped out of the opera house in Linz which was an Austrian, Austrian city on the Danube River. They had just watched the performance of Richard Wagner's Rienzi. It's a fairy tale, tale story of a poor boy of ancient Rome who became the ruler of a vast empire. Now, it's important to know at this point that Richard Wagner was a devout follower and heavily influenced by the German philosopher Nietzsche, who developed the concept of a super race, a super race of human beings with all the inferiors with genetic abnormalities and so forth weeded out. It was Wagner and Nietzsche who played this large role in Hitler's obsession with Aryan supremacy and the extinction of all other impure strands of humanity. As the two men walked silently through the cobbled streets, Kubizek said, Hitler seemed propelled by an invisible force. He led the way up a steep hill called the Feinberg. And at the top, they looked down on the Danube River, shimmering in the moonlight. According to Kubizek, Hitler turned and took the hands of his friend and said, something important has happened to me tonight, Gustav. As I watched the story of Rienzi unfold, I seem to be seeing my future. I too am a poor boy like Rienzi. I too will rise to become the ruler of a great empire. You will hear much about me in the future, my friend, he said. Hitler and Kubizek met again 30-some years later. And according to him, he said, Hitler said, remember that moonlit night on the Feinberg? In that hour, it began, he said. Robert Frost spoke of two roads. So did Jesus. He spoke of a broad road that leads to destruction. It's a much-traveled road, for there are many that go on it. It is the road of self-centeredness. It is the road sometimes of ease, and yes, it can also be the road of meticulous observance of laws and rules. But there's a narrow load, road which leads to a hill where stands a cross. It is the road of self-surrender. It is the road of relationship. It is the road of righteousness. It is the road of obedience. It is the road of life. How you look at the role of the law is quite interesting. 
Because if you look at it and divorce it from a relationship with Christ, you're just keeping rules and you're exercising self-discipline to do it. But if you enter into a faith relationship with Jesus Christ, and in that love relationship, and in that following after him, you find yourself obeying, and you find yourself changing and being transformed from the inside out. That comes not from the road of self-discipline. It comes from the road of self-surrender. You have to go there. And that's why that road doesn't have as many people on it. Because if there's one thing you and I don't want to do and we'll fight to the bitter end, it is what? Surrender. But there's no other way. There is no other way. Which road are you on today? I chose the road least traveled by, and that has made all the difference. <clears throat>